Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is our seventh lecture of the spring series. Unbelievable how fast time has gone. And I think spring is actually coming. Yay. So I'd love to ask Michael Orlansky of our program committee now to please introduce today's speaker. Michael. Thank you, Carol, and good afternoon to everyone. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Melissa Willard Foster. She's an associate professor of political science at the University of Vermont. Professor Willard Foster earned her undergraduate degree at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in Washington, DC, a Master of Arts in International Relations at the University of Chicago, and her PhD at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, focusing on international relations, quantitative methods, and comparative politics. At the Harvard Kennedy School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Melissa held a fellowship at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. At UVM, she teaches classes on international relations, international security, and foreign military intervention, among other topics. She's had a long-standing interest in the causes of international conflict. Among her many publications is the recent book, Toppling Foreign Governments, The Logic of Regime Change, published by the prestigious University of Pennsylvania Press. Professor Willard Foster grew up in Rentham, Massachusetts, and has lived in many other places including the Czech Republic and Japan, where she worked as an English teacher. Now that she's glad to be back in New England, she enjoys hiking, jogging, skiing, and kayaking whenever time permits. The title of today's lecture is Promises, Promises. Do presidents keep their foreign policy campaign pledges? To help us answer that, timely and provocative question. Please join me in welcoming Professor Melissa Willard Foster. Thank you so much, Dr. Orlansky. I, I appreciate that kind introduction. Um, I am gonna share for you uh, my screen here in just a second. Bring up my, my presentation for you. If you would bear with me while I get the technology up and running. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume everybody can see my screen. <laughs> this is a little bit like my classes <laughs> where I wait for somebody to interrupt me and, and signal me if, if the, uh, the technology isn't working. Um, but thank you again, uh, Dr. Olansky, for that, that kind introduction. Thank you to Triple E for your invitation. I'm so pleased that you're, you're interested in my research. Um, and I, I think it's timely, and I, I hope you, you will as well. Uh, I thought by way of introduction, I would tell you a little bit about how I came around to this project because this is still a very new project for me. So I have to start with the caveat that um, there's still a lot that I don't know. There's a, there's a lot I won't be, a lot of questions I won't be able to answer today, but, but a lot I, I hope to sort of provide you my inis, initial insight on. So uh, the idea for this book actually came to me in late 2016, 27, early 2017 because around that time I was finishing up my first book, Toppling Foreign Governments, um, which as you heard in the introduction, is a book that examines the why countries overthrow foreign governments. And one of the findings that came out of that book was just how common the practice of foreign imposed regime change is, um, certainly in terms of US foreign policy. And what I found that pretty much going back to Franklin Roosevelt Every president, save Gerald Ford, uh, who perhaps was not in, in, in office long enough, uh, had undertaken some form of foreign imposed regime change, whether it was a covert action like the 1954 CIA overthrow of the Guatemalan president or an indirect, indirect operation where funds or weapons were given to insurgent groups. So you might think of uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion or Reagan's support for the Contras, or whether it was a military invasion that we see uh, more recently in Iraq and Afghanistan. Foreign imposed regime change 
is a remarkably common policy in US foreign policy. But what stood out to me most is that even when presidents had campaigned against it, we still saw them undertaking it. So the most noteworthy example of this, of course, is George W. Bush, who as a candidate in the 2000 election said during his second presidential debate, I quote, I just don't think it's the role of the United States to walk into a country and say, we do it this way, so should you. I think what we need to do is convince people who live in the lands they live in to build the nations. Of course, Bush goes on to launch two of the largest nation building projects since World War II in Iraq and Afghanistan. But the more I thought about this, <laughs> the more I could think of examples where Bush was not the only president to go back on his promise, his campaign promise. For example, Dwight Eisenhower campaigned on a policy of rollback. Rollback was essentially, um, was about foreign imposed regime change. It was about rolling back communist governments, overturning, overthrowing communist governments. It was an incredibly popular campaign pledge uh, but Eisenhower didn't really believe in it. And in fact, once he was in office, he conducted a policy review and the policy review, to no one's surprise, uh, showed rollback was gonna be too costly, was gonna raise the risk of war. And so Eisenhower ends up basically backing containment, which was the policy he had criticized during the election. Lyndon Johnson uh, famously promises uh, to not increase American involvement in Vietnam. In fact, during the 1964 election, he's quoted as saying, we are not about to send American boys nine or 10,000 miles away from home to do what Asian boys ought to be doing for themselves. And Johnson is the president that significantly increases US involvement in Vietnam. And it's just the following year that he sends uh, 3,500 Marines to Vietnam. Even Jimmy Carter. Carter runs on uh, a campaign to <clears throat> revise American foreign policy to, to keep it in line with American values and the promotion specifically of human rights. And he promises not to be giving uh, US foreign aid to countries, of, to, to, to governments that violate human rights. And by and large, he does fulfill that pledge, but there are some notable exceptions. So one of those is in the Congo or Mobutu Sese Seko, uh, known to, to his regime is known to commit gross human rights abuses, but is yet receiving vast sums of US foreign aid. Reagan promises uh, not to negotiate with terrorists, but that's exactly what he does um, in order to get the release of US hostages held in Lebanon by Iranian backed um, terrorist groups. And this effort to release these hostages is what will ultimately lead to the uh, Iran Contra affair. And President Obama promised to close the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay, where detainees were being held from the global war on terror. And this was a promise he was ultimately unable to fulfill. So if all of this is, is sort of getting you to think along the lines I was thinking of at, at the time, you might be saying, of course, presidents don't keep their promises. Don't they all lie? You know, aren't, isn't this kind of what they're programmed to do? Isn't what this is? Isn't this what the political game is about? And you know, if that's what you're thinking, you're in good company because studies show that, by and large, the public does regard politicians as liars, <laughs> as not fulfilling their promises. Um, but there's also some scholarly work to support this view. This isn't just sort of the, the public perception. There's scholarly work that also says that in fact, you know, presidents actually, they don't intend to keep their promises. Um, a lot of what you hear in campaigns is election rhetoric. And it's aimed at winning the, the largest number of votes presidents can possibly obtain. So they don't really have, they don't set out with this intention, according to this particular theoretical perspective, to, to, to fulfill their promises. In fact, a famous American political scientist, Elmer Eric Schatzneider said, uh, quote, party platforms, which are, you know, these are documents that are written up by the party that the president adopts and are filled with their pledges. Party platforms persuade no one, deceive no one, and enlighten no one, 
So according to this view, there should be no expectation that presidents would ultimately keep these, these pledges that they make when they're candidates. But that's not the only perspective. There is another uh, perspective based on our models of political representation that says, in fact, presidents have a strong incentive to keep their pledges. And this is because voters engage in what is called retrospective voting. And retrospective voting simply means that when voters go to the polls, they consider not only what are the policies that the candidate is promising, but also how has the candidate performed on his or her previous promises, or how has the party performed? And so this is something voters keep in mind. Oh, is, this, is, is there any to believe, reason to believe this, this candidate is gonna fulfill their promises? Well, how have they done so far? So based on this, this would tell us actually presidents have st strong incentive to keep their uh, promises because they know they're gonna be judged on their record ultimately. So what does the empirical data say? Um, this is kind of what the theoretical perspectives in political science tell us. They're, they're, they're somewhat unclear whether or not presidents, we should expect presidents to keep their promises. Um, but what does the, the data say? Once we look at pledges and fulfillment, do we see a clear pattern? Well, we actually don't have a lot of research on foreign policy pledges, but there is a rich literature on domestic policy pledges and fulfillment. And so what you see here um, is a uh, chart put together from uh, data that was compiled by other political scientists uh, who did a review of the literature on domestic policy pledge fulfillment. So these are pledges that relate purely to domestic policy, healthcare, tax reform, education, et cetera. And the trend here is clear that actually presidents keep a majority of their campaign pledges. So in the left-hand column, this is the year in which the study was published. Uh, the first one being 1968, the most recent being 2004. Uh, the middle column lists the time period that was uh, under study and the right-hand column indicates the percentage of uh, campaign pledges that were kept. And most of these studies uh, consult uh, party platforms when looking for campaign pledges. So as you can see, the vast uh, majority of these studies find that a majority of pledges are fulfilled. What about foreign policy? Well, this we don't know because there's strikingly little work on foreign policy pledge fulfillment. Uh, we really don't know whether when it comes to foreign policy, presidents are just as likely to keep their pledges as they are with domestic policy or whether they're less likely or even more likely. So on the one hand, we might imagine that presidents actually are more likely to keep their foreign policy pledges than their domestic pledges. Um, and that's because there are fewer formal constraints on their foreign policy making power. So when I talk about formal constraints, I mean um, institutional constraints enshrined in the constitution, legal constraints. Um, the constitution sets out certain powers for the executive, the judicial, the legislative branch. Um, and foreign policy is the area where the president actually has the most influence. And this is why actually a lot of can, uh, candidates run on domestic policy in order to get elected, but then as presidents, they're really remembered for, for their foreign policy and, and, and what they did or did not accomplish. Um, and that's because that's the area which they tend to have uh, more freedom of action. But on the other hand, there are quite a few obstacles that presidents encounter in foreign policy making. Some of these are similar obstacles that they face in domestic policy making, and some of them are new obstacles. Um, so for example, informal constraints. These arise with domestic policy as well. Uh, bureaucratic actors, interest groups, the media, even a public opinion could influence the kind of foreign policies the president is able to enact. Bureaucrats in particular, when it comes to foreign policy, can have a lot of influence. And this is because a lot of our presidents don't have uh, a lot of foreign policy experience to draw on. Uh, many of them served as governors, have limited foreign policy knowledge. And so once in office, they tend to rely heavily on, on, on the bureaucracy on, yeah, for, for information, for policy options, 
And so bureaucrats can influence the process along the way by, by limiting the menu of options the president could choose from, by choosing what information to emphasize, what information to de-emphasize, by leaking information to the press to um, either raise the profile of a particular policy or, or critique a, a particular policy. So there are various ways along the policy making process where informal actors can exert some control. But unlike with domestic policy, presidents also face some international constraints when it comes to uh, foreign policy making. Because if they're making promises that depend on the cooperation of their allies and their allies decide not to cooperate, well, then that's going to obviously impair the president's ability to fulfill a promise. But it's not just allies that presidents have to consider. Foreign rivals and enemies may take action that preempt a president from fulfilling a promise made during the campaign. So international constraints are something that, that really could um, form an obstacle to a president who's trying to enact a new foreign policy. Lastly, as I said before, presidential candidates often don't have a lot of experience in foreign policy. And so not only does that mean that they're more reliant on bureaucrats once they're in office, but also as candidates, they might be more likely to make promises that are infeasible and practical or impractical, just promises that, that ultimately they're not going to be able to keep. So these are the reasons why we might imagine foreign policy might actually be difficult uh, or rather foreign policy pledges might be difficult to fulfill. So this is a focus of, of my new book, this question, do presidents keep their foreign policy pledges? Um, I'm curious about understanding what the record looks like. So my hope is to collect data on presidents' pledges and to, to look at the fulfillment of those pledges, see how well they've done. Does for, how does foreign policy end up comparing to domestic policy? So as I said, I'm, I'm still at the beginning of this project. Um, so I, I hope one day, maybe I could come back and, and show you the results once the project is complete, uh, but that may still be a way off. But at this stage, I do have some initial results that I can show you. So in my research, I am looking at various areas for campaign pledges related to foreign policy. So what is a pledge? This is a definition that I've borrowed from the literature on domestic policy pledge fulfillment. And this literature uh, adopts one definition of a pledge. So multiple scholars adopt this definition. They define a pledge as a statement committing a party to one specific action or outcome that can be clearly determined to have occurred or not. So this is what I'm looking for. Now, where do I look for it? There are various areas uh, where pledges might appear. One, campaign materials and speeches. So this is a rich source uh, for very specific pledges. Two, party platforms. As I said previously, each of the, the, the two major parties in the US political system adopts a party platform every presidential election. With, I should note, the exception of the uh, most recent election, the Republican Party chose not to adopt a, a platform for the first time um, in, in history that I know of, uh, and instead uh, simply chose to back President Trump. But most election years, uh, the, the two parties concoct a platform, and those platforms are mainly written by party elites. So they're not necessarily written by the president, which makes them a little less ideal as a source for pledges. But Every presidential candidate, with the exception of Bob Dole, um, <laughs> various reasons, uh, have chosen to, to adopt the party platform. So most presidential candidates will say, yes, I agree with this platform, and, and these are the policies that represent my agenda. And so to that extent, they do represent what the president is promising. They're also very helpful because they provide sort of a consistent source for, for pledges. So with campaign materials and speeches, a lot of the pledges that we, we will gather will kind of depend on how many materials are out there or how many speeches are out there. The party platform is just one consistent document that we have for every election going back to 1952 um, that specifies pledges. So it allows for this sort of uniformity 
when examining pledge making over, over um, a long period of time. The third source are presidential debates. Now, these, like party platforms, like campaign materials and speeches, they have their pluses, they have their minuses. The, the positive thing about presidential debates is that they're widely publicized. This is what the American public hears. So when we think about whether or not voters think presidents keep their pledges, a lot of what voters are gonna be judging the president on are the pledges that are made during these, these televised debates. The downside about presidential debates are twofold. First, there are not always presidential debates. There are some election years in which there have been no presidential debates. Uh, Nixon, for example, chose <laughs> after his defeat to Kennedy, chose, decided he was not gonna go through the, the, the televised debate process again. So we do have some election years where there are no presidential debates. Um, another shortcoming is, is they're more informal. The president is speaking off the cuff. So the president may you know, stumble over words or say things somewhat imprecisely in ways he or someday she may not necessarily mean. So, um, so for all of these, there are sort of positives and negatives, but I hope to get a complete picture of what are the kind of pledges each president has made as a candidate through looking at these three sources. All right, so now I can show you some of my initial data. So with the help of a couple of research assistants, I've gone through the platforms, the, pres uh, the party platforms of every president um, and actually also his opponent, um, although I, I, I'm just showing you here the results for uh, the presidential, the, the winner of the election. Um, this graph shows you the number of pledges that appear in the platforms of each of the presidential candidates that goes on to win the presidency. Um, and uh, as you can see, some of them <laughs> are, are quite verbose, uh, have made quite a number of pledges. Obama, who I'm currently in the midst of, of coding fulfillment for Obama, uh, that's 191 pledges um, that we have to go through and, and figure out whether or not he, he was able to carry them out. Um, Reagan, though, is the winner with 199 pledges in the 1980 election. So some of these, you know, are brief and, and uh, Johnson only made 29, Eisenhower in his first election, 22. Some of them are going to require quite a bit of work to code whether or not the president fulfilled his promises. So this is where I'm at in terms of party platforms. I have not been able to collect much data on campaign materials and speeches yet, so I don't have anything to show you on that. However, I have collected pledges for two presidential debates, Obama's first term in office, the 2008 election, and Trump's first term in office, the 2016 election. So I coded pl uh, pledges in those debates, um, and I was also able to code fulfillment. So what this graph shows you is that, in fact, both presidents had fulfilled a majority of their promises. Now, in hindsight, if I could recorrect the, recreate this graph, I would have put Trump in red and, and Obama in blue because that would have better aligned with their party affiliation. But my apologies, Trump is in blue <clears throat> and, and Obama's in red. But what I want to focus your attention on is just this large, you know, these tall bars here under the fulfilled category. These are the number of pledges um, on the very far left-hand column are the, are, is the, the cumulative number of pledges. Um, and the vast majority of them do go fulfilled. A few are mostly fulfilled, meaning, you know, pretty much they're fulfilled, but I can't, they don't quite pass the bar. So one example is, is Obama promises to withdraw troops. Um, uh, actually, Yes, he promises to withdraw combat brigades from Iraq by within 16 months, and, and he does it within like 18 months. So that's a, a pledge fulfillment that goes in the mostly fulfilled category. Partially fulfilled means, well, there was some progress made. Clearly, the, the president made an effort here, uh, but either he was blocked, he faced some obstacles that, that he couldn't overcome, or, you know, maybe he lost interest. We, we don't know. We don't really see additional action to get full fulfillment. And then there are a few pledges that go unfulfilled here. Now, there's something I want to stress here, um, because this, this is still a very incomplete picture, as long as I don't have campaign materials and speeches. And the reason why is, is sort of best 
explained by way of example, <clears throat> and that is Trump's promise about the border. So in the 2016 debate, Trump pledges to strengthen the border with Mexico. So he talks about building a strong border, we need to strengthen the border. But he never says what he says elsewhere, which is that he's going to build a wall and he's going to get Mexico to pay for it. So that pledge goes unfulfilled. He is not successful in getting Mexico to build a wall. And in fact, even building the wall, you know, there's a little bit of hedging here on whether how much of the wall is actually new wall. Um, but when we talk about, when we look at fulfillment for what he actually said in the debate, which was that he is going to strengthen the border, on that mark, you know, if, if that's the bar he has to cross, well, it's clear he does take policy action towards strengthening uh, the border, making it, uh, the obstacles to crossing the border much more difficult. So that's why ultimately I really would like to have pledges from these three primary sources, campaign materials and speeches, debates, and party platforms, so I can really get a fuller picture of what the actual pledge is um, and, and how it looks in its various forms. Okay, so this brings me back to this question that I posed here at the beginning. Are, are politicians dishonest? Well, are we as a public, if, if that's what we think, are we wrong? Are politicians actually much more trustworthy, much more credible than, they, than we give them credit for? Well, maybe so and maybe not. There's reasons to believe that why what you hear in a campaign might not ultimately match up with what you get as policy. So consider this. When presidents make their pledges, they make two types of pledges, broad pledges, but also narrow pledges. And what I've noticed in, in my assessment of, of the data is at least this, this sort of first initial assessment is presidents are more likely to fulfill these broad pledges than they are narrow pledges. Now, what do I mean by broad versus narrow? I'll give you an example. So in the 2008 election um, season, Obama promised to send two additional combat brigades to Afghanistan. So this is a narrow pledge because it's something that's very specific. It's very clear what he's talking about. And it's very clear for me as a researcher to decide, did he do this or did he not do this? A broad pledge is exactly as stated, it's broad. <laughs> There's an example uh, that Obama, uh, a pledge that Obama makes um, is we will focus on building up our special forces. What makes this broad is that Obama could fulfill this pledge in a number of ways. So even though it counts as a pledge, he's pledging to take a, an action, it's not clear what that action is going to be. Is it gonna be grading, greater funding for special forces? Is it gonna be more deployment of special forces? Um, what does you know, focusing on building up mean? That's something that's left for the researcher to interpret. Um, but it also provides a little wiggle room for candidates so that you know, if they take some sort of action towards this goal, it's gonna count as fulfillment, even though what the public may hear and what the public may anticipate will be something much more. So, you know, perhaps the public is anticipating he's going to be sending out special forces everywhere, where in fact, all he's done is, you know, maybe did some additional training. Um, he actually does increase reliance on special forces, though, I should know. Another type of uh, pledge that we see that is more common to be fulfilled are, uh, hold on for a second, action pledges. So, just as there are broad and pledges and narrow pledges, we have action pledges and outcome pledges. And action pledges do appear easier to fulfill. I'll give you an example. So in the 2016 election, Trump makes an outcome pledge. He says, we're bringing GDP growth up from 1% up to 4%. This is a pretty big pledge, and ultimately he does not um, fulfill it. But it is an example of an outcome pledge. So it is promising a specific outcome. Now an action pledge is sort of requires the president to, to pass a lower bar, simply requires the pre president to take action towards a certain goal. So for example, one, ex one action pledge that Trump makes is I'm going to renegotiate NAFTA. So in terms of what the public hears, they may be expecting, okay, 
president's going to renegotiate NAFTA and that's going to have a certain outcome. So voters may be focused on the outcome, but when in fact, if we look at the specific pledge, the president has only promised to take action towards that outcome. So that is one way, that's one reason why presidents may appear to fulfill the majority of their promises, but that's not the impression that voters have. One more reason why what voters here might not be exactly what they get in terms of policy is that a lot of the, the promises in party platforms and debates and campaign materials uh, are actually, many of them refer to pretty minor things, things that most voters probably are not following very closely. Whereas the promises that are more likely to be broken are probably the kind of issues, the kind of problems that the public is paying attention to. So these major promises may be more likely to be broken. Now, this is still a hypothetical for me. I haven't been able to test it yet, but it is a hypothesis I, I do hope to test eventually. And my suspicion here is that <clears throat> a lot of these major promises get broken because they involve intractable problems, problems that perhaps bedeviled the previous administration and are still around for the incoming administration who's also going to struggle with them. And these intractable problems often are intractable because there are a lot of obstacles to change. There's a lot of obstacles to fixing them. So presidents may encounter some of these obstacles as they try to carry out their pledges. Um, and these obstacles can un ultimately undermine their efforts to fulfill a pledge. So what are some of these obstacles that presidents face when it comes to fulfilling their promises? Well, I have classified the kind of obstacles I've come across in my research um, according to four different types. And these are based on whether or not the constraint the, or obstacle the president face is a formal one or an informal one, or whether or not it's coming from a domestic source or an international source. So let me tell you a little bit more about these. A domestic constraint that is also a formal constraint are the kind that are enshrined in the Constitution. The Constitution gives certain powers to the executive branch and the legislative branch and the judicial branch. When it comes to foreign policy making, Congress and the Supreme Court have uh, less power in a lot of ways than the president to affect foreign policy making, but they still have power. So for example, Congress controls um, the purse. <laughs> Congress can decide whether or not to fund some of the president's uh, foreign policy pledges. This is a problem Obama had to consider when it came to increasing troops in Afghanistan. He was pretty confident that Republicans would support what came to be known as the Afghan surge, uh, but he wasn't sure that his own party would support it because there was a lot of skepticism among Democrats in Congress about whether or not it was going to be worth the money. Um, the Supreme Court has rarely uh, interfered with foreign policy and foreign policy decisions. There's been a couple of notable exceptions, um, but by and large, the Supreme Court, although it does have the power, if a case were to come before it, generally does not interfere. But the president's predecessor could also influence his or her menu of options. Um, presidents sometimes when they're leaving office anticipate the kind of policies their, their successor might adopt and may try to shift policies in ways that they want or perhaps limit the pres new incoming president's range of options. This is something that George H.W. Bush did uh, with respect to uh, Bill Clinton coming into office. Uh, George H.W. Bush anticipated that Clinton would bring the United States into the war in Bosnia. And at the time, there was uh, a, a war going on in Bosnia that involved gross human rights atrocities, but there was also uh, a disastrous famine in Somalia and Bush really thought that some, the Somalia crisis would be easier um, for the United States to intervene in, um, less likely to lead us down into the, uh, you know, a Vermont, uh, sorry, <laughs> Vietnam style engagement. So he commits uh, troops to, um, to, to a humanitarian intervention in Somalia, partly, and I want to stress partly, to preempt Clinton from bringing the United States into Bosnia which ultimately as part of NATO, the, we do intervene, but that's much later. 
All right, informal constraints. As I mentioned before, bureaucrats can exercise a lot of influence in the, uh, the policymaking process, as can interest groups and their lobbyists, um, who you know, may work together to rally uh, public opinion by using the media for or against certain types of policies. Presidents may also uh, face constraints from international or foreign actors. Um, and these could also be both formal or informal. So formal in the sense that uh, the United States is a member of certain international institutions uh, or has committed itself to certain international treaties. And so we have certain obligations as a result of membership in these institutions or our commitment to these treaties. Um, informal constraints that come from the international realm these can come from our allies who may or may not be willing to cooperate with the president's policies. They can come from our rivals who may preempt the president from enacting certain policies. Or they could come from third parties, uh, terrorist organizations, who could undertake action that dramatically shifts the president's course. 9-11, many people argue, really changed President Bush's foreign policy. Uh, his foreign policy pre-9-11 and post-9-11 some scholars argue almost looks like two different presidents. Okay, I'm gonna give you some more examples of each of these with the exception of one, uh, the international formal constraints. And the reason for that is there's, there's not a lot of great examples of these because um, the United States is, is very selective in terms of the international commitments it makes. And part of the reason is because they, presidents don't wanna be constrained by international organizations. So we have fewer examples of these. <clears throat> okay, what are some examples of a domestic formal constraint? Well, all of these examples I'm gonna give you are from Obama's first term in office because this is kind of where I, I have my attention right now, where my research is, is taking me. So um, Obama promises to close the detention camp in Guantanamo Bay in the 2008 election debate. How does he perform on this? Well, as I said earlier, he's unable to fulfill this promise. Why? Why is this promise not fulfilled? Well, here we really see the influence of domestic formal constraints. Congress blocks the funding to transport prisoners from Guantanamo Bay to the United States. So this effectively makes it impossible for him to do this. Now, while this promise was actually pretty popular among Democrats, um, when it came down to making the decision about where these detainees were gonna be moved to, there was a lot of pressure on local members, on members of Congress, senators, look, we don't want these, these terrorists in our, in our backyard. So this is why you know, Congress, as a collective was, was pretty opposed to, to allowing Obama to close Guantanamo. Um, but it wasn't just this. A lot of uh, detainees actually were able to, to file um, <clears throat> uh, complaints because they, many of them were held without habeas corpus. So they, they were held without evidence, without right to an attorney. And based on this, a lot of them were, were granted their, their freedom by lower American courts. However, the DC Circuit Court, which was staffed uh, with more conservative judges, overturned most of these decisions. Um, so these, these detainees were ultimately forced to, to stay. Um, the other category of prisoner that Obama uh, runs into difficulty with are these forever prisoners. And these are the prisoners that really, you know, the evidence indicates they're just too dangerous. That if you let them go, there's a high probability that they're going to initiate a terrorist attack on the United States. Um, I should note there's actually an international element to this, uh, this example. Obama does try to transfer some det detainees to other countries and he faces two problems. One is a lot of their home countries are too unstable for him to transfer them to. So if he did this, he risks them, them disappearing and, and rejoining their terrorist organizations if indeed that, that's what they plan to do. The other problem is um, some countries are, are willing to take the detainees, but they want payment. <laughs> they expect something in return. And, and some of the demands are just too great for Obama to say yes to. But to paint this, uh, this, this pledge as a complete failure would be a bit misleading because he does have some success in reducing the population. So when he comes in to office, 
um, there are 242 detainees in Guantanamo Bay. By the time he leaves office, there's only 41. Okay, a domestic informal constraint on pledge fulfillment. What is an example of de um, domestic actors who have informal power on the policymaking process? Well, Obama talks about, um, during the campaign, a lot about the danger that chemical uh, facilities pose in the, in, a, in the United States. So a lot of these chemical facilities lack um, security measures that would keep them safe, that would prevent terrorists from infiltrating them and using them to create some sort of havoc. So he says in the debate, we've got to make sure that we're hardening our chemical sites. But interestingly, he actually does not ultimately take action on this until his second term <clears throat> in 2013, after a uh, West Texas uh, fertilizer plant explodes and kills 15 people and injures hundreds. And it's only after this that he actually, you do see some movement on this pledge. So the question is, why do we see him do so little here? Well, there is an initial effort to require um, a lot of these chemical plants to um, submit you know, who's working for them and to have the government run background checks on them. And this gets blocked <clears throat> because of interest group pressure, namely, May mainly from the industry, industry groups who are opposed to the additional paperwork and who say it's gonna be too costly for them. But labor and environmental groups aren't terribly happy either because they want, um, they want more effective legislation. They, they're not happy that they think that what he's proposing doesn't go far enough. They want a, a more effective plan. Okay, my last example of an international constraint, a constraint that's coming from the international realm, but is informal in nature, um, is relates to the war in Afghanistan. And a pernicious problem when it comes to the war in Afghanistan is Afghanistan's production of poppy. Um, which ultimately goes to produce opium. So Obama during the 2008 campaign highlights this, says we've got to deal with this. It's a major problem. It's uh, the Taliban is using pop profits from the poppy trade to, to profit and to uh, run its insurgency. So we have to take care of this, but he can't ultimately. And a major reason of that is because the Afghan economy is reliant on poppy production and I couldn't have found a better quote really to speak to this. This is the former director of a, a, a State Department group that's tasked with um, you know, dealing with this problem. And he says, urging Karzai, who was the Afghan president at the time, to mount an effective counter narcotics campaign was like asking an American president to halt all US economic activity west of the Mississippi, i.e. it's just not gonna happen. Okay, so in summary, I just to conclude, um, do presidents keep their foreign policy pledges? My initial results say yes, um, but I do want to ca caution that those results are incomplete. But at this stage um, of the game, it does seem that what I'm finding is compatible with the research on domestic policy pledge fulfillment. Will pledges match reality? Well, that's, that's probably unlikely as far as what voters hear being what they get, because the pledges that tend to get fulfilled are ones that are somewhat easier for presidents to keep. It's the bigger pledges that um, involve bigger obstacles that voters are more likely to be paying attention to. Those are the ones that are probably less likely to be kept. What are some of the obstacles presidents face? Well, I've talked about both informal and formal constraints as well as domestic and international constraints that can arise um, when it comes to fulfilling presidential promises. So where do I hope to go from here? Well, <laughs> as you can see, the road ahead is long, but I, I am eager for the challenge. Um, I am intending to complete uh, fulfillment, the fulfillment data uh, within the next year is my goal uh, to look at whether or not presidents have kept their, um, their pledges in those platforms that I showed you earlier. And I hope to be able to compare pledges across sources too. Uh, the pledges that appear in campaign materials, the pledges that appear in debates, the pledges that appear in party platforms. And I think this is important because a pledge can take different forms in those venues. So I really want to kind of try to get the pledge that really um, it sort of best exemplifies what voters are paying attention to. Some additional questions I hope to answer. 
are which of those obstacles I talked about are the most common for presidents to encounter. Are bureaucrats really their biggest problem? Are interest groups really their biggest problem? Or is it really our allies and international actors that are ultimately why presidents run into problems trying to implement their foreign policy? Um, how long does it take for presidents to fill, fill their pledges? We have this understanding that presidents try to get as much as they can done in their first 100 days. But there's also an expectation that perhaps in the last year they're in office, just before their reelection, they might have incentive to try and make good on a lot of those promises. And finally, I'd like to look at other causes of pledge fulfillment. So the domestic policy pledge data talks a lot about economic conditions. When those are good, presidents might be uh, better able to fulfill their promise, promises. When they have rich experience or a longer time in office, these things could increase pledge fulfillment. So I'm gonna end there. I wanna thank you all so much for your attention and I look forward to taking your questions. I'll go ahead and I see we have some here in the Q&A. Um, and if you give me a second while I sort of look quickly at, at the question, um, I'll, I'll be happy to answer it. So my first question here, uh, it says, it seems President Biden didn't make too many foreign policy pledges. Just wondering what can be made of his foreign policy goals based on his pick of Tony Blinken and their interactions between Blinken and the Chinese as well as Biden and Putin in the past few days. Yes, a great question. In terms of Biden's um, foreign policy pledges, uh, I don't have, um, I haven't yet coded his, the pledges made in the 2020 election. And I started to, and then I discovered that there was no Republican party platform for the 2020 election. It's the first time in history, the Republican party decided it would just throw its support to Trump and, and do what Trump, uh, and back whatever Trump's promises were. Um, so I don't have them for the 2020 election. So I can't say for sure whether or not uh, he didn't make many foreign policy goals. Um, I will say that foreign policy tends to matter less than domestic policy in elections. So, which is why I think it's very common for voters to really kind of walk away with this impression of, well, I'm hearing more on domestic policy and not so much for foreign policy. And the exceptions tend to only be if the country is undergoing a war or if there's some sort of major security threat um, or, or if foreign policy has sort of captured America's attention as it did you know, in the Bush years with what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. So in the 2008 election, foreign policy actually did have a lot of impact. This most recent election, I think with the pandemic, domestic policy was really the focus. Um, in terms of Blinken and, and his views, you know, Blinken's been around a long time. He advised Biden um, when Biden was vice president. The two of them share a lot of views. And, you know, I honestly see that somewhat as a disadvantage. I think um, populating your, your cabinet with folks who, who may not agree with you is a good thing. Um, and it's really important to call that those differences in opinion. Um, but certainly in these last few days, we we're, we're definitely seeing Biden take a, um, a clearly more forceful approach to Russia in particular um, than, than, than did Trump, um, or Putin in particular than did Trump. Um, but, but, you know, Biden is also continuing Trump's sort of way of interacting with China, which is to see it as a threat. Um, why didn't Bob Dole adopt his party platform? I, you know, I read up on it and I wish I could tell you in detail now, um, but I seem to recall he's, he's, he's saying pretty much what a lot of people know, which is that this is a doc document written by party elites that it doesn't really necessarily represent, um, you know, what I intend to do. So I wish I could give you a more detailed answer on that because it, it's been some time since I looked at his reasons for that, but, but I do recall that um, him rejecting it as, as not sort of emblematic of his, his campaign. Um, let me just scroll a couple of more. Well, what kind of resources um, could I use to look at the pledges of somebody like George Washington? And um, what kind of resources would I be able to use uh, to see if those pledges are kept. Um, 
I would love <laughs> to be able to to research for my research to go that back that far. Um, I think I'm already I've got perhaps possibly too ambitious of a plan to even just go back to Eisenhower, um, considering that some of the the presidential candidates here and their platforms have nearly 200 promises that I will have to uh, find pledge fulfillment data on. So um, that would be very difficult. I imagine there might be, you know, um, retrospectives of, of foreign policy that I could consult to see if, if major promises were kept. Um, but I don't want to focus on just major promises because if major promises are more likely to be broken, then um, it would give us an incomplete view because even though voters may care more about major promises, I think it's pretty interesting that on these more minor things, which voters might not be paying attention to, but may nevertheless have a significant impact on the way the world works, that on those issues that presidents are more likely to fulfill their promises. Um, oh, my resources for looking at fulfillment. That's a great question. Um, so, so far, I'm looking at Obama's first term. This is where I've done most of my work. Um, <clears throat> and I am getting a leg up on this because uh, there's a website, Politico, wh who has researchers, uh, and they've been researching pledge fulfillment by both Trump and Obama. Now, they don't go beyond um, Trump and Obama, uh, which I plan to do. They're also using exclusively campaign materials and speeches. So um, they, that, when you do that, it leaves open the possibility that you're somewhat cherry picking um, pledges rather than kind of looking at the whole span of pledges. So that's why I'm looking at platforms and debates as well. But in terms of looking at fulfillment, this has actually been really helpful because they're, they're reporting um, and their sources are very good. They often consult experts. But where they have not uh, done any research on some of the, the pledges I've come across, I've been able to use various sources. Um, just you know, news articles have been very helpful. Um, congressional reports, uh, the Congressional Research uh, Service puts out congressional reports that um, you know bring sort of tell you the history and bring you up to date on certain policies. Um, so so far, I've been able to track a lot of these. Uh, some of them, you know, tell, I've, I've been reading a lot of books about the war in Afghanistan, Obama's policy in Afghanistan, that has really sort of also helped me judge those promises. Um, I see a lot of interest in, in the Bob Dole and why he, question about why Bob Dole didn't adopt his party's platform, and I regret that I can't tell you more detail on that. Um, just a second as I, I read another question here. Um, so I have a question, um, does the population vote with promises in mind, those kept versus not kept? It seems that Trump would have, or maybe would not have been elected whatever promises he kept or not. So this is a great question. And it goes back to these debates we have in, um, in, in the discipline about whether or not presidents really have any intention to keep their promises. And there is a body of research that says exactly what your, your question somewhat implies, which is a lot of what's said in campaigns is really just meant to win votes. Um, I'm actually reading Obama's book, Promised Land, and, and he talks about how he's learned on the campaign trail that voters don't care about his eight point plan for whatever such you know, policy initiative. They just, they, they wanna hear you know, his values. What does he represent? Um, and so, you know, there's this understanding that a lot of voters base, vote based on their values rather than on their interests. And so if voters are voting based on their values, then they're really they're kind of picking up on rhetoric and they're not necessarily looking at each pledge and judging it <clears throat> on the likelihood that it'll be fulfilled. But that's just one scholarly perspective. There's this other perspective for which, you know, uh, in discussions of political representation is sort of one of the major schools of thought, which says that presidents understand or politicians understand <clears throat> they're gonna be um, judged on their record. And because they need to worry about their record, they, they really have this intention to keep a lot of these promises that they're making. So you know whether or not voters actually do truly care about these promises, it is interesting to note that 
uh, certainly with domestic policy, and it appears quite possibly with foreign policy, that, that presidents do try to keep these promises um, for fear that they will be judged if they don't. Okay, I believe there might be some more here. Okay, um, yes, there are some other questions here. Let me figure out how to get to them. Apologies, I feel I, I'm seeing the chat, which I believe has, okay, here they are, thank you. Um, Let me, um, <clears throat> let's see, all the presidents shown in your graph, um, except perhaps Eisenhower, made more pledges in their second term than in their first. Do you have any theories on why this is the case? That's a great question. Um, you know, there's something interesting I noticed in uh, presidential platforms, and that is, yes, that there are actually an increase in pledges in the second term. But a lot of these pledges are what we call status quo pledges. So that means the wording is something along the lines of, we will continue to, we will maintain such and such a policy. Um, a lot of the platform sort of, um, you know, is, is sort of blowing the horn of what the president has done. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a bit of cheerleading going on uh, in the platform, celebrating the president's accomplishments. Um, and so that is, uh, to some extent, a lot of those pledges are what we call status quo pledges. And status quo pledges are also believed to be easier to fulfill because it's easier to maintain the status quo than it is to change it. Now, why there would necessarily be more pledges in the second term, you know, one thought that comes to mind is simply presidents get a little bit more confident. They, they have the experience now of having been in office. They have uh, experience in terms of policymaking writ large, but also foreign policymaking. So perhaps that might give them a little bit more confidence to, to make more pledges in the second term. <clears throat> um, I have a question here about, are there any patterns in terms of which types of promises GOP presidents keep versus those Democratic presidents keep? Um, you know, I, I don't have enough data on that to answer that conclusively. When I looked at my platform promises, uh, I did try to look to see if there were any patterns that could distinguish Democrats from Republicans. And I did not find any clear patterns uh, in terms of the number of pledges. Uh, we had you know, Reagan with nearly 200 pledges, but then we had Obama with 191 pledges. Uh, Hillary Clinton, who you know, doesn't go on to, to win the election, her platform also had uh, over 190 pledges. So um, we do have some presidents with just a lot of pledges some with, with very few, uh, and it didn't seem to break down along party lines at all. In terms of fulfillment, I'm still at the beginning of the project. Um, what I looked at in terms of Obama and uh, Trump for their first terms, um, I did not see any uh, patterns, clear patterns yet in terms of which ones were more likely to be kept. But this is actually a, a direction I hope to go in. I'd like to see our security promises more difficult Security promises are things that would relate to the use of the military or the national security interests of the United States. Um, how do they compare to economic-based pledges that may involve uh, international trade, for example? Um, and how do those compare with uh, diplomacy-based pledges that have to do with our interaction with other countries? So um, I'm coding the pledges as I go based on the issue area in which they fall. And I'd like to see, you know, when we look at fulfillment, do we see any clear patterns among those? Okay, let me take a look here at some others. In your view, do presidential candidates sometimes make pledges, threats, or statements that are directed largely at foreign allies and adversaries? Might the main pur purpose be to convey a message to foreign leaders rather than an intent to fulfill a promise? Well, that's a really interesting idea. Um, and I believe it's quite possible that we might see some elections where we see some promises of that nature. One that comes to mind is, is Hillary Clinton in the um, 2016 election reassuring US allies <laughs> that the United States was here to stay as a, as a leader. Um, but like I said, a lot of ca campaigns are directed at domestic policy. 
because by and large, that's what voters care about and that's where their focus is. Well, I see uh, Carol here back on screen, so I will wrap it up. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm sorry if I didn't get a chance to your, answer your question. Um, hopefully one day I can come back when this is complete and, and give you a fuller picture. Oh, Melissa, thank you so much. This was very interesting. We can't wait to hear more about your uh, new book and be able to see it and hear about it. So it's terrific. Thank you. Good luck with your research. Thank you very much. Thank you.